My next guest, her name is Sibel Edmonds. We turn now to Sybil Edmonds. We are talking about money laundering. You used the word treason. The State Department asked the Bureau not to investigate it. And America's people have the right to know this. I'm sorry, but the word Israel is just screaming on the inside of me. The nuclear and the drugs is a global game. You have to look at the connection. Sibel Edmonds, born to a Turkish family in Iran, spent six months as a translator for the FBI. It put her at the heart of a major intelligence scandal. In June 2002, the scandal broke in the Washington Post. Sibel and a colleague, John Cole, alleged that spies had infiltrated the FBI language services section. It all started the previous year. One morning in September 2001. I never planned to be a language specialist. This was not what I was planning. Four days after September 11, I got this phone call and they said they really needed my services and they had completed the background check and when I could, uh, when could I, when could I start? There were all these documents, there were all these audio tapes that needed to be translated. There were all these people who had been detained and they needed to interrogate them and most of these people didn't speak English. Our first effort is to identify any associates related to the hijackers. Victory will come over time. Respond immediately. More than and, those and at that point, the chaos of that time period with September 11 and, you know, it was... How could you say no? When I got there, I had no idea what exactly I was going to do for them. See, this department, this language division in the FBI, is considered the highest security unit in the FBI. Sibel Edmonds lived in Istanbul and Tehran to the age of 18. She speaks Turkish, Farsi, and Azeri. The FBI recruited her to translate wiretaps in Turkish that it had recorded inside the United States. The targets were suspected of espionage or of having links with terrorist organizations. By December 2001, Sibel had been working at the FBI for two months. Then, one Sunday morning, she and her husband Matthew got a call that would turn their lives upside down. Sibel had been working for the FBI about two months after the 9-11 uh, occurrence and one Sunday morning um, we received a call. One of the other translators in the department where she worked in the FBI called up and said uh, that she would like to come over and introduce her husband to us. Uh, we had never met her husband my wife, of course, had met uh, the other translator. Uh, her name was Malik Jan Dickerson. Her husband's name was Douglas Dickerson. I was seated here. Sibel was seated beside me. Uh, Malik Dickerson was seated in this chair here, and Douglas Dickerson was seated over here. The husband did most of the talking, and he started out right away giving a background, telling us who he was. He had worked for the Air Force, both in Turkey and in some of the Central Asian republics. He described how they had met in Turkey, the fact that he had been in Turkey, the fact that uh, he was in the arms procurement business, he worked for the government. Liaison with various uh, countries in, in the region, boom, weapons procurement. But fairly rapidly, he started to describe uh, the fact that he had friends in the Turkish community. Uh, he wanted to know whether or not we knew about some of the Turkish organizations and I said that, well I thought you need to have 
some sort of business uh, relationship with Turkey or a reason to be a member of that organization. Uh, he at that point said, you, Sabelle, all you have to do is tell them who you are and what you do, and you can be a member of that organization, and then you can retire with a very good life. Sibel realized she had been approached by spies who had penetrated the FBI language services section. And then we escorted them to the door and wished them good day. I didn't know at the time, had no idea that what had just taken place was going to have such a dramatic effect on our lives and had such a devastating effect on Sibel. How had Malik Dickerson infiltrated the language services section? And what was this mysterious organization the Dickersons were involved with? Initially, I reported all the stuff to my supervisor in December 2001, and nothing happened. And actually, I was told to just hush it and, and not talk about it. So I reported it to somebody in the mid management. And then this retaliation started, you know. They were taking away my job assignments, and I would go on my computer, and I had real urgent documents that were requested by certain agents from certain field offices, and I couldn't bring them up on my computer. My computer was confiscated, uh, and the attitude toward me in that department by, by supervisor that I was working uh, for. So I, I said, well, this is time for me to take it to the highest level, to the headquarter and to Director Muller and his assistant. And I did that. And that even backfired more. For Robert Muller, the director of the FBI, Sibel had become an embarrassment. The reprisals intensified. Sibel was taken to a building in Chinatown for a lie detector test. Well, he asked me like things about security, whether or not I was approached by, by, you know, spies and to be recruited, which I said yes. While Sibel's colleague, Melik Dickerson, was assigned to translate the Turkish wiretaps, some of which targeted her mysterious friends, Sibel's work came to an abrupt end. Uh, it was March 22nd, Friday, about 4.20 p.m. Sibel's allegations had made too many waves. The person in charge of security division, a Sukum broker, said, well, I would like you to hand me your key to your, to your cabinets and your badge. And I said, well, may I ask why? Based on what reason are you firing me? And this guy, Friel, said, you know why you're being fired? You're being fired because you reported these issues and you reported them to the headquarter and we don't have to give you a darn reason why you're being fired. And at this point he got up and he's like, now you're going to be escorted outside the building. At this point, three of them, they are escorting me downstairs. And on the way down, Thomas Friel told me, he said, we will be watching you, we will be listening to you, you cannot talk about any of these issues that he reported outside. You cannot, you don't even have a right to go to any attorney. Sibel was out of the FBI. But now everyone in the language division was talking about the Dickersons. The time had come for them to disappear. Douglas and Melik Dickerson flew to Europe, never to return. Disowned by the FBI, Sibel decided to turn to Congress. She arranged a meeting with Senators Patrick Leahy and Charles Grassley. They started talking about whistleblower protection and how I would be covered. And I said, just wait a minute. I am not a whistleblower. I'm not blowing the whistle. And they said, no, you are a whistleblower. And I said, no, I'm not a whistleblower. It took me months and months until I just kind of resigned. I said, fine, I'm a whistleblower. Sibel didn't stop there. She filed two claims, one for unfair dismissal and the other for breach of freedom of speech. The Department of Justice had no choice but to start an internal inquiry. Months went by. Seeing that the inquiry was leading nowhere and that Congress had failed to act, Sibel turned to the media. We had wiretaps that were translated. Where do you think the truth lies? 
And that's what the American people need to learn about. I'm talking about those those people who make decisions not to act on certain translations, certain intelligence pieces before 9-11 and after 9-11. They haven't mentioned anybody who actually is connected to Al-Qaeda in mid or higher level. And it's just Kafkaesque. Sibel had gone too far for her former bosses. The FBI director handed the case over to the then Attorney General, John Ashcroft. Ashcroft's reaction was extreme. On October 18, 2002, my uh, tenth wedding anniversary, I was informed that the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, had invoked this rarely invoked privilege called the state secret privilege. Based on this privilege, everything that had to do with my case was considered top secret, classified, and a matter of national security, which requested the courts to put a stop in any process that dealt with my case, whether or not I was right or, or not. State secrets privilege is an all-powerful political and legal weapon dating from the 1950s. In the wake of 9-11, it was a favorite of the Bush administration. Muller and Ashcroft managed to block Sabelle's lawsuits. The message was clear. Keep quiet or go to jail. Gagged in the name of national security, Sabelle said no more for two years. like this awful awful time so I came to this point that nothing was going to happen and during this time uh, they had established just finished establishing the 9-11 Commission we must uncover every detail and learn every lesson of September the 11th keen to unite the country at a time of conflict the Bush administration agreed to a congressional commission of inquiry into September 11th its mandate included investigating shortcomings in U.S. intelligence agencies that had made the attacks possible. This is the only hope we have, this 9-11 Commission report. They're going to say what's wrong, for example, with the FBI translation units, which a lot of things are wrong. Behind closed doors, Sibel gave the Commission her testimony, once again revealing all she knew. And the White House had just made its first mistake. Condoleezza Rice had just come out and made the statement saying, I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center. To say that we had no specific information, that was an outrageous lie. And she's a national security advisor there. And all those people, they report to her, say we didn't have it. So when we came out of one of the 9-11 commission hearings, um, 9-11 family members, they just pointed at me and they said, you know, she's one of those people who was outraged with the recent statement by Condoleezza Rice. And suddenly all those cameras started flashing on my face. It's like, well, what do you think of this statement? And I said, well, that was an outrageous lie. And then for the first time, that made all the headlines. Civil Edmonds, can you repeat again the information that you have to substantiate? And I gave an explanation. I said, she said we. We includes National Security Advisor, includes the FBI, the CIA, the NSA. That's what we means. And she said we. Sibel's comments sowed the seeds of doubt in a nation yearning for truth. Condoleezza Rice was forced to backtrack on what she had said. As I said to you in the private session, I probably should have said I could have not imagined because within two days, people started to come to me and say, oh, but there were uh, these reports in 1990.